For this video, I'm going to walk you through how to do names and formulas for covalent compounds. Uh, so covalent compounds are different from ionic compounds because covalent compounds involve a sharing of electrons between atoms in order for each of those atoms to get happy. So in ionic, we had a transfer of electrons, literally one uh, element did not want the electrons and the other element did, and that's how they ended up with their magic number of eight valence electrons. But this is different for covalent. Covalent involves two non-metals. Okay, that's important. You have to be able to recognize that a covalent compound, a covalent bond, is going to be between two non-metals. So you do need to be able to recognize the non-metals. And in order to get happy, each of the elements is not willing to totally give up their electrons, uh, but they are willing to share to get happy. So if you look at this picture here on the side, you can see that between these two atoms, if each wants eight, you would expect there to be 16 total electrons. But if you count the dots, there's actually only 14. These two electrons right here are shared and they count for both essentially. So with just 14 electrons, these two atoms can get happy. Okay, so sharing is important here. It's a way that these two atoms can kind of almost like they think they have the magic number they want, but in reality, they're sharing to get that. Um, so covalent compounds are also known as molecular compounds because they form molecules. Okay, so whenever you have a covalent bond here, uh, that's going to be a molecule. You've heard of like molecules of water. And there are a few elements here, which we call diatomic molecules. These elements can only exist in this diatomic state where they're, they're not by themselves. So if you're breathing in oxygen, you're actually breathing in O2. All right. When we, when we made the hydrogen balloon go boom in class, all right, we were actually dealing with H2. OK, so these particular elements you do need to watch out for. They can never be by themselves. And that's going to be important when we get to uh, reactions later on. If you're doing a reaction with chlorine, you're not reacting something with Cl. You're actually reacting it with Cl2. So I think you'll find here that uh, covalent naming and covalent formulas are much easier than ionic. Uh, it's a much set of simpler steps. There's no yes or no. You just literally do the same steps every single time. But you got to be careful because there are some uh, differences here. And you got to know, like, these are the steps for ionic. These are the steps for covalent and keep them straight in your head. Uh, so the first thing you do, once you realize you have a covalent compound, once you look at a compound and you say, okay, these are two nonmetals, then you know it's covalent and you have to follow these steps. Okay, so the first thing you do here is you just literally write the name of the first element. Whatever the first element is in the formula, you just write the name of it. And then you take the second element and you change the ending to IDE of that element. Okay? But the difference here, because now that's very similar to ionic, okay? But the difference here is you have to use prefixes to indicate the number of atoms of each of those two elements. So the formula will tell you how many there are of each of those atoms. So you have to use the correct prefix to indicate that. And there's a little note here. You cannot use mono on the first element. So if you look at these prefixes, and you do need to know these prefixes here, mono means there's one of a particular element. Well, if the first element in the uh, formula of a covalent compound just has one, you would not use mono. OK, if the second element just has one, then you would use mono on the second element. OK, remember, prefixes come before. OK, so you do need to watch out for these. All right, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. All right, but you would never use mono on the first element. And I think as we do some examples, you'll see that these steps are pretty easy and uh, you'll get the hang of it. OK, so now we're ready to try some examples here. You're more than welcome to pause the video and try these on your own and then come back and see if you got the right answers. All right, so the first example I see here is N2S3. The first thing I notice is that this has two nonmetals in it. Therefore, I have to name this like a covalent compound. You have to be able to recognize that this has two nonmetals and then you have to know the steps for doing covalent. So the first step for covalent naming is you write the name of the first element. So N is nitrogen. So the first part of this name is going to be nitrogen. 
Okay, and then the second step says you write the name of the second element, but you put an ID ending on it. So this is sulfur, so it has to become sulfide. Okay, so the last step in the covalent naming says you use prefixes to indicate how many there are of each. So the nitrogen has two. The prefix for two is di, so this is dinitrogen, and then three sulfur, the prefix for three is tri, so trisulfide. So the correct name of this compound is dinitrogen trisulfide. So when you get to the second example here, CO2, many of you might know that name right away, um, but it has two nonmetals in it, so you follow the rules. Write the name of the first element, so it's carbon followed by the second element, but an IDE ending, so oxygen would become oxide. And then you use prefixes to indicate how many there are of each. So there's only one carbon. There's no number listed there, so there's just one carbon. But the rule says you would not put mono on the first element. So even though there's just one carbon and the prefix is mono, you don't write anything for the prefix for carbon. And then the oxygen has two, so the prefix for two, again, is di. So this is carbon dioxide. If you forget some of your co covalent naming rules, it's not a bad idea to think of something like CO2, carbon dioxide, that you know, and then you can kind of apply the rules to something you already know here. So now we're ready to try to do some covalent formulas here. As I said, covalent goes much faster, the rules are much easier. So in order to write the formula of a covalent compound, all right, you would have the name, and the first step is you literally write the element symbol from the name. So the, the name will tell you exactly which elements are in it. So you write those symbols. And then the prefixes in the name will tell you how many of each of those elements there are. And the difference here between this and ionic is you would not simplify a covalent compound. Even if the numbers can simplify, you don't simplify. So, all right, let's take these rules and jump right into an example. Again, you can pause the video if you want to try it and then come back and see if you got it right. So the first example here is dinitrogen pentoxide. All right, so according to the rules, you write the element symbol for each from the name. So the, the first element there is nitrogen. I see dinitrogen, but it's nitrogen, so that's just N. And then pentoxide, remember the second element would end in IDE according to our naming rules, so oxide would just be O. And then the prefixes tell you how many there are of each. So if it's dinitrogen, that means there's two nitrogen. And if it's pentoxide, that means there's five oxygen. So N2O5 would be the formula for dinitrogen pentoxide. Again, it's a lot easier than ionic, and it's, it's not that bad. So now we're just gonna try some more examples here, doing some names of covalent compounds. Again, you're more than welcome to pause the video, try them all, and then come back and see if you got them uh, correct. So the first thing I notice about all of these compounds is they all have two nonmetals in them. If they have two nonmetals, boom, you immediately know it's covalent, you need to follow the rules for covalent. So just a quick review of these rules, all right? For covalent compounds, you write the name of the first element, and then you write the second element, but with an IDE ending, and then you use prefixes to indicate uh, how many there are of each element. So you do need to know the prefixes. We would never put the prefix mono on the first element, even if the first element just has one. You don't put that on the first element. So the first example I see here is CCL4. All right, so when I follow the rules, uh, it's gonna be carbon. That's the first element. Uh, and the second element is chlorine, so that's gotta end in ide, so it's chloride, and then prefixes here, uh, there's just one carbon, but I never put mono on the first element, so it just stays as carbon, four chlorines, so that's tetra, so this is carbon tetrachloride, all right, second example here, first element, nitrogen, second element, IDE, that's going to be oxide, uh, and then there's two of the first element, so that's dinitrogen. There's only one of the second element. You are allowed to use the prefix mono on the second element. Okay. So this would be dinitrogen monoxide. Okay. Um, next example here. All right. SF6. All right. Follow the rules. First element, sulfur. Second element, IDE. 
going to be fluoride. Using the prefixes here, the sulfur just has one. We don't put mono on the first element. The uh, fluorine has six. The prefix for six is hex. So it's sulfur hexafluoride. All right. So the fourth one here, we have NO2. So it's going to be nitrogen. The O is going to be oxide because it has to end in IDE. We don't put mono on the first element, even though there's one nitrogen. And then there's two of the oxygen. So it's nitrogen dioxide. Okay. So we got the next example here is CO. So we got carbon, write the name of the first element, second element, IDE. All right. Now they both have one, but we don't put mono on the first element, but you can put it on the second element. So carbon monoxide, you might have heard of that. Uh, and then the very last example here, we have B2H6. So we got boron. And then hydrogen would be uh, hydride when it ends in IDE. So when you put your prefixes on, it's diboron hexahydride. Okay, so these are some examples here of doing some covalent names. Okay, so now we're going to try some uh, covalent formulas here. So the first thing I recognize that all of these uh, names here are covalent. They all have two nonmetals in them. They all follow covalent naming rules. They all end in IDE. They all have prefixes. Okay, so when I do this first one here, diphosphorus pentoxide, all right, first thing you want to notice is if you look, notice the A is not there. Usually you might expect if the prefix is Penta, you might expect penta oxide, but sometimes they drop off um, the last letter there in the prefix if the uh, element starts with a vowel. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. If you were to include it, it's not a big deal. You're still following the spirit of the rule. All right. So when we do this one, all right, we pull out the elements from the name. So I see phosphorus is the first element, and Oxide would be oxygen for the second element. And then the prefixes tell us how many there are of each. So for phosphorus, there's di, so that's two. And for oxygen, it's pent, so that's five. So it's P2O5. All right. So then when we go to the second one here, tetraiodine dioxide. All right. The first element's going to be the iodine. And the second element, again, is going to be oxygen. And the prefixes tell us how many there are of each. Tetra is four. So it's I4, di is 2, I4, O2. And notice we don't simplify this. Even though those numbers are both even, they don't get simplified like you would see in ionic. It just stays as I4, O2. All right, next example, we got sulfur hexachloride. So sulfur is S, chloride is Cl. Uh, sulfur has no prefix with it because it's just one. You would not put mono on the first element, so you don't write anything for that. You don't put the one if there's just one. You just leave it as the element itself. And then hexa is six. So it's SCL6. When we do nitrogen trioxide, we got N and O. And then tri means three. So NO3. Some people get this confused with the polyatomic ion nitrate. If you remember back to your polyatomic ions, NO3 one minus is nitrate. But this is just NO3. So there's no charge with it. That's what makes this a covalent compound, not a polyatomic ion. When we got carbon tetrahydride here, we got C, we got H. Uh, there's just one of the carbon, so we don't write anything. And then for the hydrogen, it's tetra, so that's four, CH4. And then the last one, we got phosphorus trifluoride. So it's going to be P. F is the second element for fluorine. Uh, there's no prefix on the phosphorus, so it's just one. We don't write it. And trifluoride means three, PF3.